Good afternoon. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Actually, do you know what? I can turn the branding off. We've started. I can get rid of all the little banners. Oh, my goodness. Do you know why? I'm slightly thrown out. Should I turn the banners off sooner? We've got 532 people watching. 581 is going up to over 600. There's a lot of attention uh, regarding this. Wow. Okay, so no wonder I'm nervous. Biggest audience I've ever had. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Parkrun UK's channel, YouTube channel, Facebook page. Thank you for joining us. Oof. Goodness. Oh, who's got their phone on? Nick, Tom, it's who's that? that? <laughs> <laughs> right then. Goodness. So everybody who will be joining us will obviously know what we're going to be talking about, about the, the return to oh, Parkrun in England. <sighs> who are we? Well, who am I, first of, all, uh, first of all? So I'm Danny Norman. I'm Parkrunner athlete number 482, 500 clubber, Uber tourist, um, presenter of the With Me, With Me Now podcast, which is the unofficial podcast. I've been very graciously asked to come and host this. We've been doing some Q and A's on our channel with Tom previously, and they've been a success. So we thought we'd continue that. And obviously Tom and Nick and everyone at Parkrun have been doing the conversations. I promised the conversation about Q and A's and feeding back. So how are you doing guys? Hello Tom, hello Nick. Hi Good Danny. Afternoon. Thank you very much for um, hosting this for us. Yeah, You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I, it's, um, I think it's a, <laughs> here we go. This is my biasness, but I, I appreciate the fact being a, a long term park runner and event director, and also have my concerns about my own event, my little Serbian Junior Park Run event I've done for five years as to how it's all going to come back. And uh, you guys have been very open and transparent about the conversation. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of that and bringing it to a, a very large audience, which I may say just going up toward the 1,000 views on the way it's going up at the moment. So hopefully this covers a lot of bases for a lot of people. So I'm yes, sure it'll and... down to 100 soon, Danny. <laughs> yeah, two hours later when we've got five people left and um, we're still talking. But obviously it's a very serious issue. It's a serious matter that we'll be discussing going forward. And so if we explain now, we're going to be focusing on the recent developments regarding Parkrun UK and of course specifically England because England is in a different position to Wales you know, and Scotland and Northern Ireland and and you guys are obviously have been overseeing a lot of this so Nick you are the CEO Tom you're the uh, chief operating officer COO in case people are wondering about the acronyms and we're going to spend some time updating the viewers on the current situation so what we're going to do is go through that and then we have Kirsty and Russ in the background. So Kirsty and Russ, they're in the lobby with us. Hello, guys. They'll be overviewing, looking at the comments. There are so many comments, I'm not able to oversee them. So we need a team of people to go through them. But they'll be picking out lots of wonderful, relevant questions about your worries and concerns that you may have about all this. And we'll address them when we can once we've got through the explanation as how things have been. So please feel free to ask the questions in the comments. And like I say, we'll try and compile them and get through them when we can. This may be a long conversation. So, shall we kick it off? Right, Tom, promise me, is your internet strong? Have you got potato internet or is it okay today? I think it's I've got internet. internet. Fantastic, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Right then, Nick, first off, is your phone vibrating away with messages, Nick? Are you a busy boy with your phone? Is that what's going off right now? I'll put, I'll, I'll put it on mute, Danny, I promise. Nick, you're online. Did you know you're online? I'm watching you right now. Yeah, um, okay, so. On a serious matter, Parkrun is a charity, and many people will have known this. It's changed to a charity from a not-for-profit organization in the recent years, and you are the CEO. So please could you explain what that means and what are the responsibilities, especially in light of all the, the COVID cases? Yeah, look, thanks, Danny. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to host this for us, as Tom said. Uh, just to reiterate a couple of points that you said there, I think like we're we're not here to hide from any questions at all and so regardless of our uh critical or um, um what level your disagreement is we're here to answer those questions and so largely um there's nothing off limits for the next uh period of time so so just to clarify that in case there was uh in case there was any question about that and and, and don't worry if you're if, your question won't be filtered out. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it will get through to us and we'll do our best to yeah. answer it to the best of our ability. So uh, so, 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 thanks, Danny. Yeah, clearly, um, as you just said there, um, I'm the chief executive of Park Run Global, the charity, a couple of uh, qualifications that would sit around that. Um, as the chief executive, I lead the executive team. 
um, and effectively, um, ultimately, the most senior person responsible for those big decisions and accountable for those big decisions um, and for um, uh, collating and collaborating with the rest of the part run team and taking those decisions to our board of trustees to get those signed off and approved. So ultimately, it would be my decision uh the, the the closing of part one and ultimately it would be my decision having collaborated with all of the team and worked with with everybody else around um to to reopen uh part one and i make that clarification just because um uh tom has fronted a significant amount of our communications um over this period and I, I have seen elements of confusion sitting around that where it may appear that uh, Tom is making those decisions um, on his own or in isolation. Um, and that's not the case at all. Tom, Tom fronting um, that last, you know, eight or 12 weeks of our communications around what we're doing is because Tom is the chief operating officer. He is responsible for um, uh, the technical element of our operations, the real uh, detail about what we do and how we do it. And so it is absolutely appropriate, in my opinion, that the best person to explain that detail has, has been Tom. However, you know, Tom sits with a group of other people in our executive team um, from all around the world. Um, and then uh, those decisions will be collectively put together and, and then signed off by our by our board of trustees. So in terms of my responsibilities, that that's what my responsibilities are. Just the, the point you raised there about Park Run being a charity, I think that's really, really important in, in terms of setting this conversation up. You, you're right, we're a health and wellbeing charity whose objectives are around making our communities and the world a healthier and happier place. Um, and that's significant because we're not a running event provider that does some good things as a consequence of what it does. We're a health and well-being charity that is committed to uh, supporting the health and well-being of communities through providing physical activity events, opportunities for running, walking, volunteering in communities and you know th that does frame a lot of our conversations in a in, in an entirely different way so so really what we do what i do is uh is lead that charity and that organization and represent the seven million park runners that are signed up um and and registered uh for park run and my commitment and my responsibility in actual fact our legal responsibility is to do everything that we can to support the positive um uh health and well-being of those communities and that becomes quite important when we consider the decisions that we're making and why we make those decisions. So, so we look at our community now and we entirely understand the levels of anxiety and uncertainty and fear that exist within certain elements of that population. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge as a health and wellbeing charity that we're responsible for the um uh the, the 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 broad population and supporting their health and well-being and we know absolutely we know that there is a, a really significant negative health impact of park run being closed for a significant period of time um and you know to give a little bit more detail around that um park run has been incredibly successful at and is incredibly successful at understanding the broad perspective of the community that take part in our events and making physical activity available and accessible to lots of people that have never done it before. So, so over the years, we've celebrated all of these stories of, of, of people that, for whatever reason, you know, too many for me to go into in detail, but emotional reasons, environmental reasons, um, uh, 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 cultural reasons, they're locked out of physical activity. And Park Run provides the first opportunity for them to get back into physical activity and make positive strides to being healthier um, and, and happier. And of course, what we saw with lockdown is that opportunity has been taken away. 
And that significant group of people, we're talking tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people, have had that taken away from them. And that is having, factually, a negative impact on their health. And so part of our urgency, if you like, is to make sure that that is a really important part of our conversation. Um, and that we're not neglecting those um, at any point in the conversation. And I think that it's it's really important to consider that when we look across that 7 million park runner population, that the vast majority um, want to come back to park run as soon as possible. And, and you know, again, we uh, capture the insight on that um, all the time, every single week. And of course, where we see our job, what's important for us is to really, really, really understand the risk element um, associated with putting on our events. We've worked really hard to do that over the last six, seven weeks. And when we are comfortable that the risk is incredibly low, then that allows us to be really confident that the benefit to the people that are being excluded of being allowed back into physical activity far outweighs the risk of putting our events back on. And, and, and really, that's the trigger point and the catalyst for us looking to bring Park Run back in the UK. Okay, fair enough. Well, okay, uh, I think that's unbelievably detailed and thank you very much for going through that. So 11 days ago, you announced <laughs> an intention for Park Run to return. So of course, everybody was very excited, myself included. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm. It's like, wow, there's this shaft of light, a lot of hope now. And it's like, brilliant, it's gonna come back to England and we're excited. And we did feel sorry for the other nations. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions about the other countries, the home nations that are obviously going to be hoping to come back too. But then, a lot of things have happened and then a lot of things have moved very fast and quick since then. The, the following day, there was a big change. And so all that work that you said that had gone in over the weeks to get to this position and then this news hits us. <sighs> yeah, take us back to that announcement when you said that we were going to be there. Uh, what I mean, the steps that got us to that point, and obviously we can talk about what then happened afterwards. So tell us, uh, yeah, what happened? How did you get to that announcement and felt it was okay and safe to do so? feels like about three years ago doesn't it it um <laughs> it yeah i mean it's been a um a, a, a this the whole last six months has been probably the fastest changing period that any of us have ever experienced or um or, or been witness to and you know events can have a habit when they're moving at great speed of, of potentially making you look foolish or making you look like you've not considered things properly. I think probably for us at Park Run, it would be important to consider how we got to that point and how long it took us to got, get to that point and what we did to, to get to that point. So um, we locked down in March and, 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 and our viewpoint was, unlike lots of other sporting organisations, we absolutely weren't in an immediate rush to get back. We wanted uh, to pause, to consider our position, um, be as collaborative, open and honest as we could through that process um, and, uh, and involve everybody as, as much as we could. So the first thing that we did was we, um, we committed to updating every single week where we were, the status around the world um, in terms of the weekly update. And, and that in itself has been quite challenging because sometimes there aren't updates. But, but when we looked at what other organisations were doing, we, we felt that it was, it was a piece that was lacking. You know, often people were in the dark, often people didn't know where to go or what the latest update was. And, you know, nothing might have changed on occasions for three or four weeks. But if you hadn't heard anything for three or four weeks, you didn't know that nothing had changed. So that's been really, really difficult. And, and you know, we've seen we've come in for some criticism for that. You know, you're saying the same thing for four or five weeks in a row. What's the point? But the point was always to give people absolute access to the latest thinking, the latest position. And, and so that was, we felt, step number one in terms of 
collaborating and communicating with our community as openly as we possibly could. And then, of course, what we did straight after that was we made a commitment to speak to, in person, um, every single event team in the world that wanted a conversation and every single uh, ambassador in the world that wanted a conversation. And we wanted to speak to them about how they felt, how they were coping, where they saw the pressure points, what they were anxious about, and, and very much that fed in to a number of our uh, operational strategies going forward. So, you, you know, collaboration and listening and understanding um, was was really key to that. And we made, we contacted over um, a thousand event teams and ambassadors and those conversations for anybody that 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 had one was a open-ended conversation with nothing off limits um, and no time constraints as long as you as long as you want to talk that 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 was um, the the way that it was so that was a can, I, can I just say very, Nick I, yeah. sorry to interrupt can I just say very quickly being one you of those people <laughs> sorry very yeah but being one of those people as an event director those conversations they speaking to the thousand event teams I was one of those event directors as you were saying about having that communication there, again, I respect that people will find that I'm biased, but if I'm trying to be as impartial as I can be, that conversation that I had with Helen Hood from the Ops team was invaluable. Yeah. It was absolutely invaluable, and it was just so reassuring. And I think a lot of the people who took up the uh, those calls, they did, they really appreciated it. So I just wanted to say that I know it's biased, but that was my it's my genuine feeling. So yeah, thank you for doing those things. And I yeah, saw a lot yeah. of people would reflect that. And the absolute reality is, and, and, and this is the, the absolute truth, elements of what we've done since then were definitely shaped by the feedback that we were getting from event teams and volunteers. So, you know, we, we have done things differently as, as a consequence of the knowledge we learned from those calls. It, it wasn't just an act of uh, uh, tokenism or, or anything other than that. It has definitely shaped our thinking and helped us um, to, to, to get to where we are. So, so from there, we moved to the starting process of developing our framework. And, 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 and obviously, as I pointed out at the start, you know, the, the framework is really um, ultimately Tom's responsibility. And, and he'll answer the detailed uh, questions that sit around that. But what was really, really important when we put that framework together was, and, and you know, I w watched... Um, some of Tom's interviews uh, he, he's done on your channel, Danny, and, and he articulates it really well. But it's critical that we maintain um, uh, the scalability and the simplicity of the park run model whilst understanding that modifications are needed and that whilst we also understand that we can't squeeze out everything that's important within the park run world, in creating a um, a new template for events, so so juggling those things is in, is incredibly complicated, and and you know from a external subjective point of view, it, it is inevitable that some people will look at them and say that there's a little bit too much there, or there isn't a little bit, but there isn't enough here. You've squeezed too much out there, or there's too much burden on volunteers. All of those things sat in our judge in our, in our um, considerations, and that's that's what we that's what we try to do in terms of starting the work around the framework. So, what will Park Run look like when it comes back? And let's start that piece of work. Very soon after that, we thought it was important to understand how Park Runners felt about returning to park run so what was their level of anxiety what was the sentiment level and what was the sentiment level all over the world so how did new zealand for example that was experiencing a very different uh, phenomena how did that compare to somewhere like sweden and how did sweden compare to somewhere like the uk how did the uk compare to somewhere like ireland so we started running um uh weekly samples representative samples that are surveyed every week um and you know with, without over specking it or without being too clever about it, you know, you are able to statistically go out to a group of people of a certain size and from that get a point of view that's representative of, of, of the whole community. Um, we've got uh, Mike Graney, an incredible uh, data guy that sits behind and works that, that through for us. So we're able to survey every single week and understand 
the amount of people that were ready to come back straight away, the amount of people that were ready to come back in in, in, in four weeks, the amount of people that were, were prepared to volunteer now and in four weeks, and also really importantly, the people that just didn't want to come back. And it's important to understand that when we started that at the beginning of July, right from day one, in every territory, there is a significant majority of people wanted to come back as soon as they could. Um, so, uh, so, we, so, so we started, building that insight and 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 what we wanted to see was how that grew hopefully in a positive manner so how people as things began to change and hopefully transmission levels began to go down and sickness and hospital and deaths and all of those things began to go down we we were hopeful that we would see more and more people become confident of, about coming back and and in a lot of the stuff that we've published um, we've talked about that. Um, at about that time, so July time, we were invited um, as you know the biggest provider of physical activity in the UK to work with the government and other mass participation events and sporting NGB providers to work with DCMS and government in um, constructing the return to mass participation government guidance. So um, uh, the the uh, guidance that came out, Tom will be able to give me the exact date, but the, the guidance that came out about the 11th of July was something that we'd, we'd been part of working alongside DCMS to, uh, to put our feedback into what was possible, what wasn't possible. Um, and, and so that guidance was released um, around the 11th of July that technically actually gave legal permission for uh, mass participation events such as Park Run to return. However, we wanted to use that as the um, overarching guidance for our own framework. So soon after that, we finished our framework and then we published our framework and we published our framework with the explicit intention of putting it up to scrutiny letting the broader community get access to it and as you'll probably remember you know not only were we transparent about answering questions around it we actually encouraged as many people to comment on it as possible and then we spent a lot of time um, putting those questions together responding to those questions in a in a, in a q a document and a really comprehensive q a document but again, once again, we also used that um, that that feedback from the broader community to tweak and move around some of the things um, within within our framework. And so then, once we'd once we'd nailed our framework, we took it back to DCMS, Public Health England, um, and Sport England, and we sat down with them and we said, "We know we fit." The original guidance we know that's right but actually let's go through this in detail um, and make sure that you understand everything that we say that we're doing so there are no surprises if and when we come back and so we spent maybe a week going through um, all of the detail with that with the relevant authorities to make sure that they just didn't misunderstand what we are and what we do that um that you know when other events are using wave starts as their mechanism for dealing with congestion on the start line that they weren't expecting that off of us um and various other uh, mechanisms so that, that process took another week or so which then allowed us um to have everything in line to be able to make the announcement um that we were returning and of course uh that there is you know a number of things that we need to line up with regards to everything that's going on around that announcement, which, which was another week or so. And that led us to the position that we were in last Monday, um, where we were able to make that announcement. Now, you know, for a lot of people, you could see that the decision largely was made a week or 10 days before that. We started to allude to the fact that there was going to be really good news coming. We started to allude to the fact that this date towards the end of October was going to be a significant uh, period of time. But until we'd got all of those ends tied up, at no, uh, only at that point did we feel we could make the announcement. And that's what happened last Monday. Okay. Wow. Okay. So 
Thank you for that. And once again, I'm noticing there's so many comments coming in. It is there's a lot of questions being posed. Um, I did pick out one, the DCMS, just in case. So I, I do want to make sure that we're talking um, and clarifying. DCMS uh, for context is Department for Culture and Media and Sport. Is that right? If I got that correct. D digital culture. Digital. Digital. Oh, it's digital. Okay. Department. Oh, Department for digital. Sport. There you go. DCMS. There you go. And um, whew, okay. <laughs> so here we are, and that's quite comprehensive. And was, I want to say as well, this isn't the only Q and A that we're doing. So if you're watching this and you're wondering about um, this just being like a one-off instance to get your questions you don't get asked, the intention and plan is to do this next week and the week after that. So we recognise, and I want to say now, that what we're doing is trying to lay some groundwork here in terms of explaining lots of decisions leading up. This is almost like an introductory paragraph. And then, of course, we can then uh, continue the narrative onward. So I respect that I'm seeing comments that the, there's no q and A's being done immediately, but it is worthwhile having this information put in, forearming the viewers with this. And then once they have that information, they can ask questions, having understood the back history to it all. So that then brings us forward to the current present time. So, Tom, <laughs> the last 11 days, the announcement came out on the very next day, as I said earlier on, the government announced tightening restrictions. There's tightening of restrictions happening all the time. Justice, I think it was about an hour ago, my phone went off with a BBC News alert. There's tightening, I think, in the Midlands. And the mood has changed in that respect, in terms of the media is obviously reporting out these cases because it is happening. Um, cases increasing, lockdowns imposed, and then people will be asking, and I'm sure this has been asked many times in the comments, was it the right time to make that announcement, in your opinion? Thanks, Danny. Um, and just quickly before I get onto that, and I know you've just been looking at some of the comments while it was while it was chatting. Um, we've not really got a time limit on today, and we expect it to go on for quite a long time. And so there'll be plenty of time for questions, and we'll we'll try and address. Um, the, all of the, the kind of the critical questions and, and I think we're seeing lots of questions coming in, in in multiple different wording and formats but the team behind the scenes is bringing those together and, and so there'll be plenty of time for questions today we we felt that it was critical to get across the detail first and and, and I think um, utilizing this channel to be able to address things in in long form as it were and really give the background and allow people then to ask really, really informed questions based on a on, on a good level of understanding. And then give May I say, I think it's quite important. Really important. I think genuine, again, this is my personal opinion, I'm going to speak here impartially, that I think it's nice that you guys are willing to put your face to it and your name to it. And you have that, you put in that personal side of things because there are many, many organisations that send out a lot of generic messages from behind uh, the brand. And whereas, of course, that you can have that in the brand and organisation that you are also taking you're putting a your personal responsibility and a face toward it. So I think there's a lot of respect that's due in that sense, because of course you may you may take uh, disagreements, you may take flack, and as long as it stays reasonable, but you put yourself in, in that um, in that uh, line of sight. So I, I, in, me personally, I think it's a lot of value to be had that you guys are being very open, very personal, making it very human, which I think is indicative of Parkrun and my feeling about Parkrun as a whole. And that's just my opinion. Anyway, sorry, Tom. No problem. And just to, to reassure people who are saying, you know, can there be one in an evening or a weekend? You know, it's a it's a work day. Loads of people are, are at work. We felt, and our experience over the last few months doing various live Q and A's, broadcasts, podcasts, so on, um, is actually we seem to be seeing pretty high numbers. Actually, possibly the highest numbers during the day at the moment. It's not normal times. I think a lot of people are at home or working from home. Um, there, there is no one right time to do things. Obviously, this will be a, be available sort of as live, as it were, in, on catch up for people across Facebook and YouTube. And this won't be the last time time we do it. And so, um, and I think most questions that people might ask will be asked during today. And so they'll find their questions are answered. Taking it back to where we are. Um, so the announcement was received. So we made that announcement as it was received as positively as any announcement we've ever made. Um, we expected it to be largely positively received, but we expected um, an, a, a decent level of, of pushback, particularly from um, outside of the park run community. And we, and we barely saw any, and of course there were some negative comments, um, but we barely saw any and it was, it was received really positively. And we were really, really excited by, by that. And at that point, and I think it's important to, because things have changed a lot since then, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment, but, at that point, 
we'd spent a couple of months working with the government, working with the deputy chief medical officers, both of whom are part runners, I understand part run. We've been working with Sport England. We've been part of a, of a steering group with, a, you know, British triathlon, British cycling, British athletics, um, London Marathon, Great Run, Human Race, uh, a few others. We'd all worked and worked and worked and reviewed the data and looked at it. And at that time, hospital admissions in the in the UK were as low as they'd been, roughly nearly. Um, uh, intensive care occupation was as low as they'd been. Deaths were the lowest they'd been. Infections were just about as low as they'd been. I think at the time, the ONS was saying about one in 2,000 people in the UK um, would test positive if tested at that time, I think is the terminology they use. So at that time, um, all of throughout that whole kind of consultative group and from speaking to our event teams when, when we rang all of the event teams and the ambassadors and it wasn't just a one-off thing you know we've been speak we speak to teams and ambassadors all the time and our, and our doors always open um overwhelmingly the 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 desire from from everybody we sp from from people we spoke to was was that a return was the right thing um and that everything was moving in the right direction um however we very intentionally uh, announced an intent to return in a rough time frame or you know, end of October, however you want to describe that. But we we intentionally announced an intent to return at a point in the future that at that time I think was eight eight weeks away, roughly, um, in order to receive feedback from from various people. So, for example, event teams say, "Hang on a minute, that's half term here." Now, half term isn't something that would normally impact us, of course, because we we've, we've operated during half term since two thousand and four. It's slightly different now because people have made other plans on Saturday mornings because there's no part run and half term's quite close. And so some people are saying, oh, I'm going to be away. And normally I wouldn't have been because I normally would have expected part run to be on. Um, and so we announced it as early as we possibly could. That was the first moment that we knew we could um, uh, launch part run and that the chief medical officers in DCMS and Sport England and, 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 all, and all of the people within that group, we all felt the the public health benefits massively outweigh the public health risks and that park run coming back was the right thing to do for the health of of the nation and when you, you're the size of park run uk um that is you know it, you are talking about impacting the health of the nation to us to a certain level um we also didn't say this date or that date, you know, technically we could have said the first Saturday of September and, and, and away we go. We also left it out till towards the end of October and as kind of an intent rather than an absolute confirmed point because we wanted to continue following the situation. You know, just as, as much as I, I'm not sure it's always the right strategy to say, I don't know, events aren't going to happen in the park until next year, let's say, because if event, it, you, you kind of, preventing things from happening when in the future they might be safe prior to that and you want to get people active. Uh, at, at the same time, you know, we, we wanted to give a bit of space and then say, you know, effectively things are looking good and we're expecting that and we're confident of that, but things could change. And of, of course things have changed and they, and they change really quickly. Um, so the following days, so we had 24 hours of, of everything looking fantastic and everybody being really excited about it and, and positive news, including from outside the part one community. Um, and the following day, the UK government announced the restriction limiting social gatherings to no more than, than six people, um, indoors or outdoors. And, and that that caught most people um, by surprise. We certainly had no, no warning of that. And um, we were confident that didn't include us. At the same time, it, was, it wasn't clear that that didn't include us publicly. And, and I know from speaking to people from across the, the sporting event sector. Um, everybody was inundated straight away with, with questions about what does that mean for us? How can, how can I not meet, how can five people in a group um, not meet with their two grandparents because that's seven people, yet a football crowd can gather or people can play football or, or park run can start or whatever it might be. And clearly that's confusing. Um, we did have, within about 24 hours, we did have... Um, confirmation through Sport England published confirmation that lots of things were exempt from that six person rule including part run um, specifically in, in, including part run um, and that certainly um, put people at ease to a level but clearly in anybody living in the UK right now and, and will, will know that, that that change to you can't 
um, socialising groups of more than six has had a significant impact on 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 society uh, as a whole. Um, we, we also saw cases starting to rise, um, and so actually, you know, having had several months of continued uh, reduction in, in pretty much across all the metrics that we that you might follow, um, and it being pretty stable actually. Um, suddenly we saw we saw cases rising significantly and cl clearly that's a really really important thing and there are nuances to that so what are the age demographics and we see that the, the big driver at the moment of cases is in the younger population and and clearly there can be functions of testing or accuracy of testing and so on but nevertheless cases starting to rise significantly and, and importantly you know we're obviously we're watching france and, and spain and and italy and, and, and other countries and seeing what they're doing and trying to estimate what what's happening here and so um, cases started increasing, which of course unsettled people as well. And, and since then, hospitalizations have also uh, increased. Um, and we saw last Friday in our um, in our Friday stats. So every Friday, we we survey about twenty thousand. We write to about twenty thousand uh, UK park runners, and, and we get about twelve hundred responses, roughly to that. And we'd seen that grow. And actually, on the the Friday before the announcement. Um, we were at 80% uh, of UK park runners, including volunteers. So people have walked or run or volunteered at park run event in, in the last 12 months. But 80% um, would come back, wanted to come back within within the four week within four weeks from that point of that survey, um, which is the highest it had been since we started recording it. Um, and 7% uh, felt unlikely to come back, which is the lowest it had been. And actually, at that point, predict predicting forward. We were expecting probably, but by the time you got to late October, that would be um, around 90%, possibly 85 to 90% saying they they definitely want to come back and and, and under 5% saying saying that they wouldn't. And, and both those groups are important. You know, we would never neglect a 5% of people who are saying, you know, they'd feel uncomfortable, but we have to we have to take everybody's opinion into account and, and, and make the right judgments. Um, on the Friday, um, so that was a week ago today, we did see um, a big knock, as you know, as a result of, we, we believe, as a result of the announcements of the of the social limit of gatherings to six people and of the increased cases. Um, uh, we saw a knock and we saw still a large majority of park runners wanting to return. So the 80% the went down 71, um, which is a, you know, is a significant drop, of course. <laughs> Um, and we saw the seven percent, which which is the people who are unlikely or very unlikely to return. We saw that um, grow sixteen, which again, which is a significant increase. You know, it's a, it's a more than a doubling. And you can see how um, overnight, almost. I mean, that was week to week, but you know, very quickly, people's um, anxiety levels and 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 people's um, view of the pandemic and the situation and, and whether or not they might come back or not can change dramatically. Um, and so th that was at the end of that at the end of that week, and clearly that made put things in a in a in a completely um, different position. Since then, we've also seen hospitalizations increasing um, in the UK, and, and of course, you know, illness is the most important thing. Um, and so we're seeing you know an, inc an increase in people uh, getting ill. Still, the numbers are relatively low, and they don't seem to be increasing in the same rate they were in the spring. But, but hospitalizations are increasing and, and, and that's a really important uh, metric. Um, and we're seeing local lockdowns and rumors of national lockdowns. So actually over the course of, of, of eight or nine days, it, 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 there's been a dramatic shift in, in the situation in, in the United Kingdom. Um, you know, really, really quick. And when you're following it every day, it's, it's been remarkable how, how it's changed. Um, so today our feeling is that with the direction of travel of the virus, um, it looks to today, and it didn't look like this eight or nine days ago, but with the direction of travel of the virus in the UK, it looks much less likely that we'll be able to, to achieve a, a late October reopening. And also from the responses we've seen so far from landowners, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, but from the initial responses we've seen from landowners, I think it's unlikely that we'll see a, uh, a a level of permissions that is conducive to returning towards the end of October as well. And so, you know, right now, that position is looking um, much less likely than it did a week ago. I think it's fair to say, Tom, then, isn't it, that that's, I think it's addressing a lot of the questions that I've been seeing in terms of the, 
the date that's been given for end of October, potentially looking unlikely, as well as the landowner factor. So, of course, there's a lot of questions about landowner stuff that you'll be addressing. Yeah, look, and I moments. think importantly, and we, we've 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 attempted to 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 take this approach all the way through. We've attempted to be methodical and and thoughtful and look at the evidence and not rush to knee jerk decisions and reactions and make decisions really, really when we need to make them. So not hold back from making decisions, but at the same time not not rush into making decisions. So at the moment, right now, we're not saying uh, we're definitely not going to be going. Uh, in England by the end of October. And, and incidentally, the reason why it's England and not Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is that, is that the, the government restrictions in um, England are such that Park Run can return and, and we, we have full sign off and approval of the framework and so on with, with, from that. And we can go into the detail if people want to ask questions about that. Whereas in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, that's, uh, that's not the case. But so, so when we're not looking to rush into a decision, clearly we need to give event teams plenty of notice around um, a return date if we're going to announce one, which would be, I would say, be at least four weeks. Which means, you know, within the next week or two, we'd be in a position where we would either need to say this is a date in the end of October, or, or actually we're not looking at the end of October anymore. And I, and I think the latter is is much more likely. Um, a lot of the questions we're seeing. Uh, are coming from around permissions and so on. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit before we kind of took the questions on them. Um, it, it, it's really complex with a reopening part run in terms of permissions. In, in England, we've got 850 events. And actually land ownership, land management and, and so on is very, very complex. So we've got a spreadsheet with with of UK events with the various information on. Um, but actually it's, it's understanding who is the actual landowner and who's the land manager and who's responsible for things is, is, is difficult and complex. And our approach at the moment is to, is to attempt to achieve that centrally. So we've been, rather than asking teams to go out and get permission, which sometimes, you know, they might not have spoken to a landowner for a reasonable amount of time and, and, and staff may have changed and, and, and so on. And so, um, whereas in normal times, it's a fairly simple process. So an event wants to start and they, they go find the landowner and, and they get permission and then we hold that permission document and some need renewing and, and some don't. And it's a fairly simple process. In the, in the world of COVID-19, it's really, really complex. And landowners and land managers have their own um, anxieties and concerns, which are different from landowner to landowner. And we're all dealing with the challenge in a new way. And we must always be respectful of of everybody's anxieties and concerns and so we want obviously we want to be in the position where where if a landowner doesn't feel comfortable hosting a part of their site that should and must and it's right that that's fully respected and and we work with them to understand when a time might might be right um so at the moment we're speaking to the likes of national trust forestry england local government association a number of um of organizations with a national reach um, looking to understand the best mechanisms for moving forward at local level with regards to permission. And we're not looking to go over, over anybody's heads or or try and cut corners. It's simply trying to apply a, a, a scalable position. And we know some event teams have been approached by, landowner, by the landowners or they've approached landowners and some have been really positive, can't wait to have you back. And some have been um more cautious or, or gone as far as saying it's not going to be possible for part one to come back um and you know we respect all of those and that's all part of the the process um of saying that we we're, we're intending announcing nine days ago we're intending to come back at the end of october and, and seeing where that uh takes us i guess finally for me before we before we open it up uh, around uh, to questions and so on um What's really important, and Nick touched on it earlier, is that the 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 decision around reopening part runs should be, we believe, it, it entirely focused within health and well-being, and that includes risk of infection, uh, both to individuals and to increasing community transmission, but also it includes the impact of part run events not being there or the impact of part runs being there. And and as we go into the winter, the benefits of being outside and active. Um, are, are even greater because it's more likely that if somebody isn't at a park run, they're, they're indoors and inactive com compared to the summer, so that's really important. Obviously, we commissioned the research by um, Canterbury and Christchurch University around outdoor transmission. 
uh, risk uh, in, in itself and in comparison to, to, to indoors. And that was really, really important. And that showed that outdoors is, is genuine, generally safer than, than an indoor environment. Um, really worth remembering as you go into winter, the more we can time we can spend outdoors, uh, the better. Um, it also identified four key areas that, that outdoor event organizers should look at, which is density, circulation, size, and, and duration. And you know, you'll find all our, our reviews of this and discussions of this on our podcast and on, on the website. It also identified non-event activities as also being important. And I think this, it's a really important thing here. And I, and I think what we've tried to do and we'll continue to try to do is understand the evidence take our time to make the right decisions based on the evidence of what is actually happening in the world. And, you know, even yesterday we saw grassroots sport being uh, blamed for um, increasing infection in the Northeast. And as far as we can see, and so, and, and some limitations on, on grassroots sport possibly, and we, we're trying to identify, to, to look at the detail of that possibly being, being in place. And when we've looked at the, the detail of that, our understanding is, is that predominantly comes from um, a, a big spike in infections. I think it's around 60 people were infected. Um, when 300 people attended a working men's club around a charity football game. I think, you know, our feeling is actually what you've got there is you've got a headline and grassroots sports increasing infections. So on, when in reality, almost certainly it's nothing to do with grassroots sport. But if we're not careful and we don't make evidence-based decisions, we're going to go into a winter where something which is really, really, really critical for health and well-being of the entire country, being social, being outdoors and being active, is prohibited not on um, the basis of, of evidence, but actually on the basis of, of headlines and assumptions, and, and that's really important. As we move forward, um, I, I think what's really important to understand, and again, hasn't been understood particularly well yet, and the reason why we commissioned the rapid review of the evidence around outdoor transmission was that it hadn't really been done, and so people were saying they think outdoors is safer than indoor without actually really evidencing it. Um, what also hasn't been done is we haven't really um, had um, any description of the of the the absolute risk. What's that? What's the actual risk? So we can say, I don't know, the start line is 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 higher risk than I don't know, being in the car park or halfway around an, an event. But but what is actually that risk? And so it might be even if something was three or four times as risky as somewhere else, doesn't necessarily mean the risk is particularly high. And so, you know, we know, and, and I've just seen today that the um, ONS statistics have obviously, as we would all expect, have shown an increase. And it was published about an hour ago, I think, showing about one in 900 people are estimated in, in the UK, I think, to have... Uh, to, they would test positive, I think is the terminology they use for COVID-19. And when we made our announcement, it was one in 2000. So it's more than double si just since we made the announcement. Working off a one in 2000, let's say, um, that that tells us what's the chance of somebody being at a part run who ha who is infected. Um, it, it tells us how many people are likely to be at all park runs when they're infected. And we can do some interesting modelling in there around actually if people who do have symptoms don't come, what does that, what does that mean? um for for example um and if we can know the chance of person a infecting person b then we can make some calculations that would say actually on a part run weekend if there were two hundred thousand people across the whole of england let's say um there would be x there would likely to be x number of people there who had covid19 and, and there would x it would be likely that it result in in x number of infections and i think that's really important when you're understanding that there's no such thing as zero risk it's important to balance the benefits against the risks. And we know that the, the benefits of part one happening and the damage of part one not happening to public health are significant. And so we should do everything we can to understand what the actual absolute risk is um, with regards COVID-19 transmission at our events so that we're able to, to, to make the most informed decision we possibly can with regards should they be open or should they not be. Fair enough. So that's 50 minutes that we've been going and I respect and I know it's in the comments that a lot of people are obviously, I think, wanting some other questions to be asked. I think you've covered a lot of bases in that too, Tom. Um, just a, maybe a rhetorical question for me, possibly the most <sighs> toughest time in your parkrun history. I mean, I've been a parkrunner for 15 years, you've been 13 years, the toughest moment in many of our lives it's it's been a tough one hasn't it um, without getting too profound and and without taking up too much time answering a non-covid question actually yeah. i think when everybody's 
pulling in the same direction, which we all are at the moment. We've been overwhelmed by the support of Sport England. We've been overwhelmed by the support of government. We've been overwhelmed by the support of the community. The staff have, have, have been incredibly supportive as well. It's a really unsettling time for the part run staff around the world. I think when, you put, when you're all pulling together like that to, to achieve a common goal, it, it's really difficult. I could do with taking my head off and putting it in a bowl of ice. I, I think I might do that this weekend. But actually, that that makes it um, an honour to be part of and, and actually not stressful in, in a really, really negative way. None of us want it to be happening. But, you know, without mm -hmm. going into the details, there were times seven or eight years ago where we weren't necessarily all pulling in the same direction and, and much, much smaller challenges were much harder to to overcome because of because of that so you know we, i think nick I, i'm sure i could speak for nick we both feel immensely proud to be part of the part run family and, mm -hmm. and we we feel immensely proud that part run means so much to so many people and and really genuinely people are all pulling in the same direction not just within part run but sport england and, and all the other organizations yeah absolutely i think it's fair to say that we all want park run to come back i think there's a bit of disagreement as to when and how and so on but we all wanted to come back everyone watching is a passionate park runner and we wanted to return and that's safe to say we're all singing off that same hymn sheet and i want to thank everybody we've had and we do have so many viewers so thank you very much for your time i recognize it as you mentioned earlier tom about the time we're doing this for sticking with us and being here and affording us your time it's greatly appreciated that it's the middle of a friday afternoon right questions are you ready for this one then first question who's going to take this andy campbell critchley who decided the benefits outweighed the risks um so it, it's a, it, that's a really good question and it was a group decision amongst many many people so so we it, it's always been important to us that we get public health guidance from the highest levels we possibly can um, and, and with anything we see, you, you know, you look at schools or universities or businesses opening or whatever, there will be medical professionals on both sides. You know, some doctors saying this is outrageous and some think doctors saying this is great. And so it's it, at the moment we're living in a world where it's impossible to get a really a consensus about a anything at all. So we've attempted to, um, to, to get that kind of position from the highest level we can. So... In the early days of the of the pandemic, we had a had a, a, a long phone conversation with Jonathan Van Tam, one of the deputy chief medical officers, who was generous enough to give us an incredible amount of his time at what must have been for him one of the most challenging times in his career. Um, and more recently, we've been in more con more contact with Jenny Harris, the other deputy chief medical officer. Both understand Park Run very very well, um, and you know, at the time of making the announcement. Um, we were Jenny Harris was certainly in agreement with us at that time, and things have you know remember the infection according to ONS has more than doubled since that time eight days ago. But at that time, um, it, it was agreed there. It was also agreed from the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, our UK board, um, our global board of trustees, our staff team um, within the UK. We have. Um, uh, a couple of frontline doctors, uh, Ollie Hart and Simon Tobin, who are, who are our health and wellbeing ambassadors, working with Chrissy Wellington. Um, we're discussing things with them. They've been part of a, of a kind of strategic conversation we've had all the way through. We've spoken to um, some uh, contacts we have in place, like World Health Organization. And it, it, it is important. To, it, it's not something that 100% of people would agree that that was the right time. But that that group I'm describing to you there, um various backgrounds and a, a number of people unanimously agreed actually that right as things stood then and things have changed since then clearly have changed drastically it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a different answer right now but agreed unanimously then that the the risks of of infection at a park run event um are incredibly low and the public health benefits of park run opening incredibly high and so at that time um, all of those parties agreed that the benefits significantly outweigh the risks. Okay, thank you for that. All right, Becky Bushnell, do you think Parkrun risks alienating core teams and volunteers by attempting to bring Parkrun events back too soon? Who's going to feel that? It, it could Tom? do. It, yeah, it, absolutely. Of course it could do. If we brought Parkrun events back too soon, it would absolutely do that. And we're, we're, we're incredibly um, mindful that you know, my wife's an, an event director of our junior park run here, and and you know, when I understand what it what it would mean 
to say to a part one event team, you need to go back into the community and you need to put on this mass gathering in your community. And so absolutely, if, if we made the decision to come back too soon, then that's a very real risk, which is why, which is why we haven't at this point committed to coming back on a specific, you know, if we could come back on a specific date, you know, that's why we said, look, we're targeting the end of October. Um, you, these things take a long time to happen. And so you have to make an assumption at some point about a time in the future. And you think actually right now it feels right. We think in eight or nine weeks, the situation will be slightly better. It's going to take us eight or nine weeks or six or seven weeks to get to that point. So let's, let's, let's make a suggestion now that we're going to do it on the assumption that things will be in, in in situation X at that point, but allow ourselves some wiggle room that it can, ch if it changes, we can change. And so, so I think, you know, as we've seen things changing, you know, right now, do I think to today, do I think it'd be appropriate for us to put event teams back into their local parks? Uh, absolutely not. And, and the positions change in eight days and it might change in the next eight days. And w w we are watching the situation very closely. And, and that that's, one of the most important things at the front of our minds every every single day. Okay, fair enough. We have got some tough questions now. I'm not going to. We don't want to. And we specifically said we're not going to avoid any tough questions. And I think this is the one that I've seen a lot of the, the ones that have been expressed the most in various groups, the one that's been pushed out by um, various parties. This is the one. Liz Price, I'm concerned. This doesn't take into account core team health risk. And then she details. I think this is... 4C from the framework. I think it's about the language. So once we decide to open a park run country, then all events in that area will be required to reopen. It will be mandatory for events to open when instructors do so. Many core team members could be isolating shielding. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the way this is phrased, sorry. But the mandatory problem is the, I think it's the issue for many people there. And then she goes on to say, many core team members could be isolating shielding, teachers are working health, etc., not wanting to increase con contact with others. So yeah, the point of contention, I think, is a mandatory for teams to come back. Yes, and it's a really complex position um, and that there is no fantastic answer to, that there's no fantastic answer to. We, we, we have a responsibility to the community, to the part one community, to to deliver events safely and to to make appropriate decisions as to when events happen and when they don't happen and you know there are uh, plenty of events and landowners who would have maybe even not closed or certainly would have come back a long time ago and and we wouldn't allow an event team or a landowner to put on a park run uh, uh, on basis of their choice before we felt it was safe to do so and that is part of our safeguarding the park run community you know remembering you know a week and a half ago 80 percent of park runners were, were ready to to come back at the same time it, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to allow individual event teams to make the decision as to whether or not their community uh came back um and whether or not that was safe or not you know for example you might have an event with twenty thousand park runners registered there we know from our numbers Today, that would mean roughly, and it's, a, it's an extrapolation, I know, roughly 15,000 of those 20,000 would want to come back. And you could have two or three or four really cautious members of an event team who might be a year away from feeling comfortable coming back. And that's that's absolutely fine. And we want to be supportive of, of, of those people and supportive of everybody and understand that. But it, but it wouldn't be also right, in our opinion, that a... a a relatively really small number of people who were anxious about the situation were able to prevent a park run returning and therefore impacting the health and well-being of a of a significantly large number of people and so we we need to take that decision on behalf of the park run community and we need to um decide that when park run events when it's safe for park run to come in, events to come back they, then they need to come back now we, we are you know, we, we know, like I say, my local park run here, we have a number of volunteers in, in the uh, vulnerable group, in the shielding group, my, mo my mother-in-law up in South Shields in the shielding group. And, you know, my parents are in the mid to late 70s. And, and so we, we understand that. And I think we should be, well, I think we will always be supportive of people who, who don't feel comfortable coming back to um, a park run event. But at the same time, it's it's important that when part run events are safe to come back, they come back, and, and we would support people who didn't want to be part of that. And hopefully, we could we could work with them and support them and be there for them, and and 
and and when they were ready to come back they'd of course be welcomed back into the into the community fair enough right next question darren john mcsweeney have you had a simple vote of event directors um, I feel like I'm taking a load of the questions here. A lot of the questions going straight to Tom, yeah. I think, I think it's right, though. They're those questions, Tom. Unfortunately, they're yours. Questions for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so, uh, no, Darren, we haven't had a simple vote of, of, the, of the EDs. Um, it, it, I'm not sure. There's a real, always been a real risk of uh, turning part right into it. Into, and, and this is one view that people have, that, that Paul liked the idea of in the early days PSA which sort of went down this route but then reversed out of it because it, it, if, if, if each decision is kind of the average of everybody's opinion we felt you didn't ever really get the right decision and so in the early days you know there was this kind of concept that actually each event would be almost like a member of park run and they'd be able to vote on decisions and 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 it would be this kind of this big membership organization like that the, the challenge is that um, like I say, as a leadership team, you need to be able to make your own decisions based on the evidence and understanding. And you know, your role is to try and develop the greatest understanding you possibly can of the information in front of you, uh, and then make a decision based on all of those kind of things. And so, of course, you know, we rang a thousand event teams and ambassadors and asked them their opinions directly in, in a couple of months ago. And we've been speaking to event teams and ambassadors multiple times every single day since then. And we've been surveying event teams. And, and ambassadors and, and, and park runners and so on as part of our weekly survey. And at the moment, all of the evidence uh, we say, so I think um, around 70% of volunteers in the most recent um, park run survey said they would come back. And not necessarily as volunteers, but when we when we survey people and said, would you, like, would you come back to park run in four weeks' time? About 70% of volunteers said they would. And now, that doesn't mean that if we had a vote of event teams, 70% would say they'd come back. But actually, I think the majority and pretty much everything we asked, the majority of people, certainly when we phoned all the event teams back in uh, May or whenever it was, the majority of people would want to come back and are ready to come back. But that doesn't necessarily take into account necessarily the views of the of the minority. So, so uh, you know, at the moment, and, and as, as our position has been for a few years, we don't tend to go down the route of, of asking for a vote in order to make a decision. Okay. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. I recognise that our viewership is dropping a little bit and I recognise we've been on for over an hour. And as I said earlier, this won't be the only Q&As and obviously we'll be able to address a lot more Q&As in uh, the coming weeks. And of course, we <laughs> time to be confirmed, isn't it, for next time? So it might, might be a bit more convenient for many people. Uh, this next question. So <laughs> you're right there, Nick. We'll try and get your question at some point. <laughs> um, this one next. Peter Chiverton. Uh, on the most recent lockdown in the northeast, one of the three reasons given for the additional spread of COVID was grassroots sport. And of course, you spoke about that. So is this a concern given the outcome from the Mike Weeds study? Professor Mike Weed, is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Mike addressed exactly this um, in his study. So Mike was saying in his study, that as well as the four um, key areas that event organisers need to need to be aware of within the context of their event, they also need to be mindful of, of, of actions outside of the event. So is your event getting people to stay in hotels or go on long train journeys or share car journeys and, and so on? I, I think this specific specific example that, that, um, that uh, I think Mr. Peter's talking about it's around what sounds like, and I know I don't want to criticise anybody, but from the sounds of it, it's three hundred people drinking in a drinking in a working men's club. So I imagine with alcohol in a confined space, that's a, that's a. It sounds like a, a particularly irresponsible activity at that time, and, and actually, you know, it is. It seems a one-off. That's not happening all over the place. It doesn't seem clearly we would be mindful of those kind of things, and it's in our framework, and we'd strengthen that kind of communication based on. Mike Weed's research, which is the reason why we asked for it. So we would be increasing our our communications around, you know, don't car share with multiple people. Do try and stay local, closer to your home park run. If you can, walk or run or cycle to your park run, do. At the same time, it's really important that we're empathetic to everybody's situation. So if somebody drives to a park run 10 miles away and goes past two that are nearer to them, then we shouldn't you know, throw stones at them and be horrible. It, it, it's, 
which I think has been a bad side of, of the public response to COVID a lot over the over the course of the last few months is we've tended to focus on individuals stepping outside of of boundaries of guidelines and get a bit too angry about that kind of stuff without celebrating that the vast majority of people are, are doing the right thing. And so so um you know of course I'd be worried about the the leader of Newcastle City Council, I think it was blaming an outbreak on part run on, you know, 300 people going to, to a pub and getting drunk afterwards, uh, you know, and, but hopefully we'd be able to, you know, address that. Fair enough. All right, then maybe one for you now, Nick. Jenny Harris, are you worried about any strong and negative media reaction to park run restarting at the local level? Um, I mean, we're worried about everything. I mean, that's the reality of the situation. The, 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 all of these elements, you know, the welfare of our volunteers, the the um, response of the broader communities, the, you know, the, the permission from the landowners, the pushback, all of those things are things that we're worried about and have considered in, in, in the decision making process. And what we've tried to do is coordinate all elements to minimise those risks wherever it is possible. And, you know, w without question, a consideration of ours as we were scheduling and coordinating our approach to that announcement was about what other uh, group gatherings were happening within communities and, um, uh, and around the country. And not wanting to be the first big group um, to put themselves out there was, was, was definitely part of the conversation. So, so are we worried about it? Yes. I think that what 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 it's worth reflecting on is that that's a conversation outside of COVID that's been uh, levelled at us on, on a number of occasions. And, and we need to remember that we are in the park for relatively short periods of time at a time where the park is relatively quiet. And the, the specific answer around would we offer support is of course we would and you know th there are a number of things that to reiterate a number of the points that we've made we believe that the community there are elements of the community that have got no access to physical activity without park run really significant tens of thousands of people and that their health is being significantly damaged as a result of us not being around we also think that the risk of return based on evidence, not speculation, but based on evidence is incredibly low. So when we put those two things together, it's a very compelling case for us to try really hard to bring Park Run back. However, there are a couple of important caveats there. If evidence showed that Park Run was a high risk activity, then no longer would the risk outweigh the benefits we wouldn't come back. And if the communities rejected us, then equally we wouldn't come back. Park Run is a community event. It works, it's it's a key element of uh, of everywhere it is. You know, if we were ran out of town um, by a mob with, you know, pitchforks, then it, it, it would be a terrible, terrible outcome for an organization that has proudly positioned itself as being part of the community. So, so all of those things are important to us. Are we worried about it? Yes. Have we considered it? We absolutely have. Are we 100% certain? Of, of course not. We never can be, but but it's definitely been part of our decision-making process. Fair enough. All right, this question I've seen quite a lot and a lot of suggestions regarding the, I guess, functioning of an event is Joseph Ritson says, any chance you could look at doing staggered starts, especially for the larger park runs that would That's keep down the mass starts? It would still be a time trial of the runner against the clock and not a race. Uh, yeah, um, thanks. Um, that was uh, that's probably one of the most common. Thanks, Joseph. That's probably one of the most common questions we get, and it sounds uh, like a really simple thing to do. And and lots of races are, are able to do it and do it. And and um, you know, there's a five k series here in Yorkshire near me that, that my friend organises, and they just do they, they do that, and it works really well. I think there's a number of reasons why it doesn't doesn't really work. Uh, it wouldn't be possible probably in a park run setting. And so if you're going to do staggered starts, you need really a timing mat of sorts at the beginning 
in, so that you can tell when somebody crosses the start line, when they cross the finish line. So you see there, so you, so you can give them a time. Um, you also need to be able to tell people when to turn up largely. You know, if you had 800 people, you can't necessarily chop them up into groups there and then bring them forward one at a time. That's quite difficult. And it starts to put an incredible burden on the on the volunteers. And so if we were going to do wave starts, we'd, we'd need some way of of understanding in advance who was going to turn up and then allocating them. Um, and that becomes really, 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 really difficult, of course. And actually, for, I'm, I'm not sure it helps with our, some of our larger events. So my uh, original home park run, Woodhouse Moor Park Run in Leeds, has a relatively small star area, which I think the team have been looking at to move into a more area of more open space. And I think it'll, it'll, be, it'll work really, really well. I, I, I think taking the 700 people they might have on the start line into, you know, 20 groups of 30 or whatever it might be. I'm not sure that necessarily actually reduces risk. It sound, wave starts sound like something that really, really reduce risk. But actually when you, when you look at the number of human interactions you have and where, they, where are they waiting before the start and so on, I'm not sure it makes that big a difference. We have looked at wave starts actively at Park Run for, for over 10 years i i remember speaking to to paulson Huey, i think it was before bushy's fifth birthday and he was worried about the, the number of people because it was growing quite quickly a lot smaller then than it is now um the original concept the first ever concept we had for for wave starts was people who could run i think it was under under 23 minutes or something would start at nine o'clock with the aim of them definitely being done by 9 30 and everybody else starting at 9 30. You, you, you end up, of course, when you think it through, it doesn't really work. So, so you know, you've got families that end up being split between those two things. You get people choosing to run in one of the two waves because they'd just rather run at 9.30 or 9. You actually potentially in, increase capacities. You have more people turning up because there is – and so you just get another 500 people turning up because there's a, there's a bit more space. And it becomes incredibly different, to, difficult to manage and complex to manage. And so we – like I say, wave starts, staggered starts – are you know something we've looked at for over 10 years we don't believe they're possible they are one of the most common things we're getting asked about now we've obviously looked at it in really closely over the last few months thinking is that really would it be possible and and, and it's just not possible as far as we can see in a park run setting in a way that doesn't completely change what's required of volunteers in a, in a dramatic way, completely change the way our results system and registration system would, would need to work. And I think really importantly, turn Park Run into something much more akin to a, to a traditional running event. And we love traditional running events. I, I, I've done loads of traditional running events. But Park Run's strength and its impact and, and it, the power of Park Run in communities is in, is in bringing people together in a, in a much less formal much less structured way and that's where the public health benefits are and, and so i think even if we could think of a way to do it which we can't but even if we could think of a way to do it i think it, it, it potentially it could be so damaging to the to the the health impacts of part line it would be counterproductive in, in itself Fair enough. right and question for you potentially then nick uh Cara mills haunch could you give us a bit more detail around some of the public surveys i think you've been doing about people's attitudes to park run returning are you able to drill down to specific areas, like, for example, in park run event areas where the course is surrounded by residential homes? So the insight element of it all. Oh, unmute. Yeah. We got you. You're still muted, Nick. Done. Yeah, what an amateur. I apologise. No worries. Um, no, I've seen a couple of questions about that. And, and, and for absolute clarity, we're not... Um, uh, we, we're not surveying members of the general public. We're only surveying um, the, the, the the park run population, and it's going out in a. Uh, so, so there are a number of surveys. We are generating insight from the park run population. Certainly, when we're open across um, uh, the whole community all the time, whether they be volunteer surveys, so satisfaction around volunteering, um, uh, happiness um uh, uh dissatisfaction um uh concern about um uh, operational challenges etc cetera, etc cetera. and then to the broader through separate surveys to the broader uh community so the participants 
as in um, walkers, runners, uh, joggers. Um, how do you, how do you feel about park runners and organisation? How do you feel it is from uh, an inclusivity point of view? Um, how do you feel about um, uh, do you trust park run? So things like that are going on all of the time, and they're going on um, weighted samples. Um, and that weighted sample is a percentage of our uh, total population. So we were able to run all of these things concurrently, um, uh, but never be asking uh, uh, the same person to participate in more than one uh, survey over the course of the year. So the reality of that is we're looking at a broad point of view across uh across our whole community we're not looking at a specific point of view because the data we'd be getting from a specific event would be incredibly um random and really really insignificant in terms of the numbers we wouldn't be able to tell very much about that what we are able to do across our volunteering survey which again we would be running at uh, every uh every two months during um when we're open is we are able to break that down to a role level so we we're able to see the differing levels of satisfaction and happiness and engagement that might be a, an uh, an ed or an rd level compared to a marshal or a tail worker for example um but but it, the specific answer to your question is no we wouldn't be looking at that level of detail um uh, could we potentially in certain areas um uh, possibly we could construct something to do that um but we haven't done that at this point okay thank you All right looping back around to you tom regarding being at the event itself brian holden says some events of narrow courses with high numbers i'm not sure how social distancing can be achieved can events opt out of restarting if core team think think it's unsafe he's muted as well <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting fatigued Sorry. Um, thank you, Brian. Um, so, so the crux of this question really is, and, and this is something we're seeing coming up an awful lot as well, is how social, how can social distancing be achieved? And I think what's really, really important is that is that in the work required to understand what the risk is, there is... Um, an acceptance, an assumption that social distancing won't be maintained at all times. And, and we've had in-depth discussions about that again and again and again with, like I say, the Deputy Chief Medical Officers and, 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 and government and Sport England and other stakeholders and advisors and so on. Um, and it's a bit like, I don't know if you go into your supermarket, it's, it's clear that social distancing isn't being observed at all times. People are trying to do the best they can, but it's not being observed at all times, and we're not and we're not seeing spikes coming out of, out of supermarkets. Now I know they're completely different to part run, but I think there is a there is a a misunderstanding um, in, and I don't think I don't think that's that's the fault of people who are misunderstanding. I think that's the, that's the fault of a, a lack of clarity around general guidance and so on. But there is a there is a misunderstanding in, in let's put it in the part one context that social distancing must at all times be observed, and so you can never get within two meters of a, or one meter plus of, a, of another person. And I think you know to go back to my nearest part run here to me, Harrogate is is a three lapper. Actually, it's quite quite wide, you know, sections around the the part that we have here in most places. But on a three lapper with 500 people, not only have you got people running quite close together for quite a lot of the time, you've got a lot of lapping and, and, and overtaking. When we've um, when we've looked at that and considered that and looked at our framework, that assumption that at the start line people will be close together for a short period of time, and that during the event itself people will be close together for short or sometimes more extended periods of time as they're, as they're running along, that is part of the understanding and the framework which which then we believe and you know the, the the most senior people we've had involved in it and from the, from the medical side of things also believe is is provides a level of safety um so nothing is 100 percent safe but provides a level of safety in line with with the framework that that, that we've done and the the research that we've commissioned that actually the chance of infection are incredibly low 
in that setting of a narrow three lapper with 600 people or uh, you know a park run with a thousand people on the start line and the way we're mitigating that is by reducing the amount of time in those places and reducing the amount of circulation and reducing the density where we can making start and finish lines and parts of course bigger however there will be pinch points there will be crowded courses understanding those things it, it is our position and, and that is a position that has been signed off at, at government level and senior public health that with the mitigations in place that provides um, a level of safety where the level of risk is so low that the the benefits significantly out, outweigh it and that is with moments and short periods of time where there isn't a a physical you know a two meter distance or whatever it might be and, and that's really important i think to understand you know it's the same as the, the kids going to school they're not always i don't know they're in bubbles and things but they're not always the distance apart or when you're going to the to the students going back to university or people playing football if you look at football matches there's two million footballers in england registered to uh i think it's uh, 2000 leagues and 120,000 teams i think it is um and of course you know in, in in the team sport guidance it says social distance where possible and we see all the time on the television and on our in our local parks and open spaces footballers doing sliding tackles and linking arms in walls and all, and all those kind of things so th there needs to be an understanding that, that there needs to be a level of human interaction and contact and in, as part of everyday life and the important thing is to understand what's the risk that that presents um, and let's balance that against the benefits that that type of interaction presents and let's look at those two together and ultimately when we saw schools going back in, in the United Kingdom which I'm sure was which we all saw was very was controversial and not everybody agreed um, there was a letter a published letter signed by all the directors of all, all the um, uh, chief medical officers and the, and the deputy chief medical officers saying that while school is not risk-free particularly in terms of children bringing virus in back into a home environment while it's not risk-free the benefits of children returning to school significantly outweighs the, the 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 risks of children going to school now of course what we're also seeing is local interventions at school level or at local public health level which don't necessarily uh tally with the national government guidance and there's a, there's a weakness in the strength there, of course. You know, you, local knowledge is really, really, really important. And it, and I'm not sure that we as a, as a country have got that balance right between between national guidance and, and local knowledge and local interventions and to what level are things localised and what, what level are things centralised. I think that's the second part of that, of, of your question, Brian, is, is could events opt out of restarting if core teams think it's unsafe? If a core team, so, and, and remember everything we've said earlier in this conversation about things have changed so dramatically over the last eight days, um, and we're not saying we are starting on this date. So I think the, everything we say is caveated in that, in that we continue to attempt to understand the rapidly changing in, environment. Um, also referring back to, to what we were saying earlier, um, we, we wouldn't be allowing a local event team to say, they don't think it's safe and therefore their event can't start. In the same way, we wouldn't allow a local event team to now say, we think it's safe, so we're going to start. However, of course, if a local event team was to say, we don't feel this part run event is safe for these reasons, of course we would look at that. And we're doing that every day with multiple teams right now. Of course we would look at that. And there could absolutely be scenarios where we would say, actually, we agree that's such a busy event, which is such a crammed start area and you can't move it to anywhere. There's no alternative start, even though we've given people, given events the ability to move, to add 500 metres to their course, to move the start line. There is no way that we can not have a, 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 a huge, dense gathering of people here. Then, of course, we would then be able to make that decision. And so actually, in this case, we're not prepared as a as a as the, the 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 management of this charity, the leadership of this charity, responsible for the health and safety of our participants. We're not prepared to accept that, and that could result in in an event not opening, and it could result, or or it could result actually in an event moving. We've have historically, we've got a number of examples of events moving course, moving venue a short distance, 
for multiple reasons and it's, uh, historically it's been through things like wear and tear and and or permissions changing and so an ev event a has moved a mile down the road to a different venue so all of those things are options that are available to us um but the two the two really really important things to kind of summarize and answer that question i guess are one is um everything we've done and sub submitted and had approved in the core of our framework is that social distancing should be maintained wherever possible but it can't always be maintained and our and our our, our assessment of the risk and, and independent experts assessment of the risk has been with that in mind two whilst we would encourage strongly encourage event teams to raise any concerns directly with us and there's a commitment for us to look into those concerns in great detail and really thoroughly really promptly at the same time it, it, it isn't for the event team to decide whether they think an event is safe or not at, at that level. Cool. Okay. Thank you for that. Right. Test and trace. This might be for you, Nick. There's a couple of, uh, sorry, test and trace, track and trace. I would help if I get the name right. Um, Simon Smith. <laughs> yeah, it's world beating. I'm um, sorry. Yeah. Simon Smith, Ashford Juniors Co ED. How are we expected to keep on top of track and trace uh, for N NHS England? For the parents, grandparents, etc., who come along on a Sunday morning to watch Junior Park run, and then a follow-up to that is from Neil Sutton: If a case is tracked and traced back to an individual that attended a park run in the prior 14 days, is it anticipated that everyone that attended that event will have to isolate? What about spectators? So I guess it's kind of two parts there: one in terms of how can you make sure that you know about everybody who's there regarding spectators, and then being able to track it back. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, uh a couple of good questions there and, and obviously there's been a, um, a a lot of comment online um, about track and trace really interesting in that we spent a lot of time uh, uh, in detailed conversations again with all of those organizations we don't need to repeat them um, but all of those organizations about our track and trace position it was universally accepted that we we very probably have the most accurate track and trace system of any organization in the UK. So, so all of those organizations were overwhelmingly um, uh, positive about our ability to be able to fulfill our responsibilities on that. Um, specifically answering Simon's question is th there will be no responsibility on local teams to manage track and trace whatsoever. Um, it is a purely a function of us as a central organization. Um, if, if there is any whatsoever, it will be to, to field the requ request from the track and trace team and direct them to us centrally to be able to deal with. Spectators d do not in any way, shape or form fall under our um, uh, responsibility. Our responsibility is, is the participants and it's very clear that our process requires uh, participants to register prior to events and to um, to turn up with their barcode, which is our mechanism for identifying them and to be able to track and trace them. Um, we've seen a lot of questions about the five, six, seven percent of people that turn up with, without a barcode, and um, what what the way that that is described within those systems as, is as human error rather than park run error. So our system is very very clear. That that's what we require you to do, um, and that we can't we can't manage that. And in the same way as if somebody gives a an inaccurate phone number or, or or any other piece of detail that goes into everybody else's track and trace system, that's considered human error. Um, it, it is considered by those organisations that are, that we are one hundred percent compliant um, with that process. So so it's important to understand at event team level that that the absolute limit. Of your responsibility about track and trace would be if you were contacted by the track and trace team you would direct them towards hq who would deal with that for you um with with regards to neil's question um it, again that's sort of out of our hands the way that track and trace would work would be that the individual that was infected would notify the track and trace team they would speak to them about where they've been very probably as i understand it it's either um, uh, it, 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 contact within two meters of more than 15 minutes is w what requires the uh, tracing requirement. We, 
which is highly unlikely to be a significant amount of people at Park Run. However, that's for the track and trace team to uh, identify and to uh, to qualify. And then they would come to us and ask us for that detail. So that detail might be, for example, a list of everybody's details that participate at that event. It might be um, uh, a specific individual's details. Our job would just be then to pass on them those details. And, and the, then again, the rest of that detail is for the track and trace team to manage, not us. So th th that would be a decision made externally. Okay. The questions are coming thick and fast. There's so many comments coming in. Uh, thank you to the guys in, in the back who are keeping tabs on these. Uh, one probably for you, Tom, now. Steve Newman, we need a mandatory 16 volunteers to have a safe timed junior park run. It was hard enough filling a roster pre-COVID. What's your stance on likely regular cancellations due to lack of volunteers? Um, thank you, Steve. Um, we... So that is a question that comes up a, a lot again, um, and the people are, are understandably really concerned about that. Um, we feel that, however, based on the, the the insight we have, and the you know we asked, for example, I don't have the numbers exactly to hand, but we we part of our survey work, we asked people who'd never ever volunteered before how likely would you be to volunteer? And it was a, an incredibly large number of people. It was a relatively low percentage, but it was when you based it on how many people have, uh, don't ever volunteer. Remember on a normal weekend, we have about 10 times as many walkers and runners as we do volunteers. Um, the number of people who've never volunteered before saying I'd volunteer um, is incredible. And so actually I think uh, it's our opinion that we would be, that all of our events would be overwhelmed with people volunteering. It is our position that in the countdown to events reopening um, at that point, when we were on an actual countdown, so if we got to the point where we said this is the date, um, the majority of our communications would be around um, offer your offer your volunteering service to event teams if you can. I think we'll see events overwhelmed, so I think that and there's there's a very limited number of volunteer. Role. So my junior part run, we need a lot more than that. Actually, we need about 24 people at our juniors, volunteers. But obviously, we can take 100. We have about 110 kids a week. We could take double that easily. So there's a lot more opportunities, a lot more space for people to 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 walk or run. Um, but our feeling is that that the response from the community would be overwhelming in terms of number of volunteers, and certainly our communications around that would be significant i think nick put it really nicely the other day when he was on free weekly timed um when vassal said what would you what do you think you'll be doing nick on the first day back and nick said i'll be i'll be staying local and volunteering now again i, I can't reiterate it enough that we mustn't beat people up who don't stay local and don't volunteer that's you know part run is founded in a non-judgmental way and portland and hewitt has always been exceptionally passionate about <laughs> not judging people and allowing people to participate in the way that they would like to participate. And that's fine. We don't need everybody to volunteer. And in fact, we couldn't accommodate even 10% even or even 20% of people volunteering. We couldn't accommodate that. Um, but I think, I think event teams will be overwhelmed by the number of people volunteering. You know, we have our, our, our like I said, our local juniors, probably a number of people who might feel uncomfortable coming back volunteering. And I, I believe it should be their, their choice. So we have a lot of, there's a lot of questions. I don't think it's come up yet today, but we have a lot of questions about um, what about vulnerable volunteer A or vulnerable volunteer B. And, and our, our position on that is we should be as clear and as transparent as to what part run is going to look like when part run returns. This is what you can expect if you turn up to a part run. But the people should be free to make their own decisions as to whether or not they engage. So we shouldn't be make. I don't believe we should be making decisions on behalf of somebody else. We see you as being vulnerable if you said to my dad you're sorry you're you, you are in your, your mid 70s so we don't want you doing this I, I think he'd be really offended at that and he wants to make that choice at the same time um my mum might be less comfortable and she might say I'd rather not do that and, that and that's fine uh that's fine too and so um I think we'll be overwhelmed with volunteers and I think in events like ours where we actually rely on 20 or 25 volunteers and there's maybe five or six that might not feel comfortable coming back who are there every week they're kind of the regulars um, reaching out to our community, I think we'd be we'd be inundated with people saying, "I'll help, I'll help." It's an exceptional time, and and I and I want to contribute um, towards you know taking part one forwards. 
Okay. Well, we're going to stick with you, Tom. Uh, Dave, I'm based in Wales, near the border. Sorry, Dave, this is the person who's asking the question. Um, if the guidance is to stay local, what's to stop people drop, uh, crossing the border? How will those local English parkruns cope? Did you talk to anyone from Scotland or Wales about why they disallow parkruns? Uh, yes, we talked to lots of people from Scotland and from Wales about various things. So, so at a at a higher level around uh, why disallow park runs, and at a more community based level, how would you feel? Would you travel? Would you? How would you feel about people coming over the border into uh, from your country and, and volunteering and whatever it might be? Um, right up to the all party parliamentary group for park run, which is chaired by um, Nick Smith MP, who's a, a, a Welsh MP. Um, and we were we were looking at the data around 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 that. We looked at some of the data from when we closed, where there was a week where um, the Republic of Ireland was closed, but Northern Ireland was open. And so we looked at the data for for how, pe how many people to actually move. There is um, a greater risk of that um, in Wales between Wales and England than Wales and Scotland. So we have we have a number more events in close proximity the side of the England, English Welsh border including Sevenbridge Park Run which which crosses over um and in fact there was Sevenbridge 10k I think a week or two ago with 700 runners doing it doing a 10k uh, there um and so the, the reason for them not being allowed is that the government guidance says they're not uh, because of the number of in both Scotland and Wales I think it's because of the numbers of of participants we've been in in contact with for example in wales the first, we've written to the first minister of may wales we've we've uh, gone through the appg and through nick smith we've recently had meetings with welsh athletics at the minute the restriction is in wales i think such that there's a limit of 30 people for an event no wave starts no time trials it is just 30 and i think that might even be including volunteers so there are government restrictions in both we're trying to unlock those I think today the numbers of infections in Wales, I think, are about half that. I think there might even still be about one in 2,000 people in Wales. So the, the risk is lower in Wales if you're basing it on the number of people who might be in, in infectious with COVID-19. The, the benefits, the public health benefits for part-run opening are obviously similar in England and Wales. So we would be, um, well, eight days ago, we would have been comfortable opening in, in Wales. Um, but those are restrictions. And, and, yeah, we continue to speak to people and, and try and understand what those challenges are and you know we see them the same it's not just an, an england wales thing or a or an england scotland thing there's also the local lockdown situation you know if we were open and as happened last night i think it was that the northeast went into a level of lockdown and I, i've not counted our events in the northeast of england but there's probably about 50 events or something in the northeast of england um what are the implications of that so what are the implications of a region of the uk being locked down um, and people traveling in and out of that. And, and those are conversations we'd have with the likes of DCMS and and public health uh, leaders locally and nationally to understand the implications of, of the best way to, to minimize the impact of people traveling at the same time, understanding that people are, as long as people are acting within the, the, the legality and with the guidelines, if they're free to travel from from Wales to England and go to a McDonald's or go to a, you know, whatever it might be, they're free to England to come to a And I'm not saying we don't, we don't mind about that, but we can't stop them. So we have to understand the implications of that, which is, you know, ongoing work. And, and, and as I think I've said, we're, you know, we're speaking to, to stakeholders at all levels across all those nations. Thanks, Tom. All right, back to you then, Nick. There's so many questions to answer, potentially. Um, Nick, can you answer this? Stuart Hayden, question. As there is no magic wand to cure all the fears around COVID, have you thought about how this may be the end of events like Park Run? Um, I'm an eternal optimist. Um, I tell the team that every day. So, um, so yeah, it's. I, I don't think it will be the end. But... But I agree with you in, in that I think that there is a risk if we're if we're not careful and we allow speculation and um, non evidenced fear to drive decision making. Um, so I think it's it's really critical that we identify low risk activities and initiatives that can support the population in being more active and improving their health. We know now, and we didn't know it at the beginning of this 
uh, at the beginning of lockdown and the beginning of this pandemic. But we know now, know now that underlying health is a really important factor in how dangerous this virus is. And we know that we should be using that knowledge at a population level to encourage physical activity and initiatives like Park Run as an extra layer of protection from the virus. If we can have a proper, robust and evidence-based conversation about absolute risk and what that is. And that's why we commissioned the review of the transmission data in the first instance, because actually nobody was having a proper, robust, evidence-based conversation about it. But if we can have that proper conversation, then we can encourage low risk activity nationwide that would help people to be more resilient to COVID. And, and that's where we wanna be in this conversation. So rather than seeing everything on the spectrum of risk and effectively allowing everything to be canceled and then fight to come back, evidence and data should allow us to see that initiatives like Park Run will help keep people out of hospital and not put people in hospital. And, and that's, that's the argument that we're trying to take forward. And I think that, th that it is beginning to get a bit of traction and I am optimistic that it will get further traction. Okay. Uh, just while I keep you, Nick, because I just want to bounce back very quickly regarding a follow up to the track and trace element. And uh, Rory Marriott has asked about will stating juniors have to be accompanied by an adult? So they must be our responsibilities regarding track and trace that you mentioned a little while ago. Yeah, look, it's an excellent question, Rory. So, so our starting position absolutely would be that, 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 that we've been incredibly transparent and open with all of those organisations we talked about, and they're completely comfortable with our track and trace system. And, and, and our position obviously was that we, we can't track and trace everybody that's in the park at that time, whether they've got a connection to our event or, or not. And I'm pretty sure that, for example, recreational football, which is, is as Tom talked about, is two million people participating in parks all over the, the country and not responsible for spectators and everybody that, that chooses to turn up or not. At the same time, as I think that through, you know, having been to a couple of athletics events over the last couple of months, to spectate at those events, I have been required to uh, to give my details and have been considered to be part of the event. So, so I guess I think there's a good question it presented in a way that perhaps we hadn't considered before um, and, and, and one that we'll take away and get greater clarification on. Okay, thank you. Right, and next question. Okay, Brian Darney, it's probably for you, Tom. So Park Run are staying with mass starts. That seems to go against all advice from EA Sport England, which specifically prohibit mass starts. I don't understand why it's deemed safe for 500 park runners to congregate at a mass start, but it's not deemed safe for 100 runners taking part in an off-road trail race. Why is that? Um, uh, thank you, Brian. So we've been, I think, I think Nick mentioned earlier, since the beginning of July, we've been part of... Um, uh, an overall kind of steering group um, looking at government guidelines, feeding into government guidelines, developing our own independent government gov uh, guidelines um, uh, amongst each other. And that's in that included, I think I only said British athletics earlier, that includes England athletics as, as, as well. And so we've been um, largely working um, together, but at the same time, those organisations are independent of each other. And so we come to um sometimes we might come to different views of what the appropriate way forward is and i think with with if we just take discrepancies between british athletics england athletics and 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 part run i think one thing's important to understand is we are we're great we're good friends with them we collaborate on loads of stuff we're not affiliated with them so we're free to set our guidelines and they're free to set their guidelines our guidelines have differed for many years actually on on many different things and we're respectful of their guidelines and, and they're respectful of our guidelines and i think that's really important and there's a there is a different approach we take so a lot of our our guidelines are set around being as simple and as sustainable as possible and and minimizing work required for volunteers and minimizing barriers to delivery of to delivery of events not just participation events and 
they have a, a, a different approach because their events are different. Typically, their you know events under England Athletics will be will be um, less frequent, maybe once a year or a, a short race series, and they might have a entry fee, so there might be a budget and, and whatever it might be. And, and you know, my my running club puts on um, a summer mile. And the logistics behind putting that summer mile on once a year are, are huge compared to the logistics of putting on Woodhouse Moor Park running exactly the same park every single week for six or 700 people all, all year round. And that doesn't mean either party is wrong. And of course, we, people might say, well, I don't understand what the safety, you know, how is it different for COVID-19 or how is it different for the chances of, of having a collapse or, some, or something like that? And that is important. But we do take those different approaches. I think in this specifically with COVID-19, we took the decision early on to to understand what what do we need to, what are the red lines for park run what do we need to protect for park run what, where can we not go regardless and protecting the time for the volunteers and the workload for volunteers and making sure that delivering a park run doesn't become just this ridiculously burdensome thing for volunteers is an is an absolute red line for us so there are things that um, would be a red line for us that wouldn't be a red line for England Athletics, for example, um, entirely appropriately for both parties. Um, and the real difference is that that means probably we come back a lot later than they come back. So there's already been a number of events. There was Q Gardens, was it 10K, I think, two days yeah. running, mm -hmm. 1,000 yeah. people. There was, um, as I've already mentioned, the Seven Bridge 10K. There's been cross country races, 5K races. So there's a set of guidelines where, where we felt actually we can't do some of the things that races can do, wave starts, limit numbers, chip timing, those kind of things. So we're going to define what our red lines are, and then we're going to work out when that is safe to come back. Whereas England, the England Athletics pro approach was, actually, we can come back sooner, and our events can do different things. And so they wrote a set of guidelines appropriate for those type of events coming back sooner than ours. So, you know, events could start from July the 11th. I think triathlons happened that weekend. I don't know whether... EA races or, or happened that weekend. But we've probably had um, two months of those athletic um, events happening, and actually, we are best case six or seven weeks away from part run events happening, and that might not happen. And so there, there is a big difference there. At the same time, w things are changing rapidly, and we're in constant. I had a conversation with 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 Run Britain this week, and, and directly with them around their guidelines and our guidelines and how they might interact. Now, there are going to be times where there are discrepancies. There are going to be times where, hang on a minute, how can, you know, I can't remember the example, but it was, you know, how can 100 people in this cross-country race not be safe? Um, but five, 500 people could take part of this park run. And there are going to be, when, when we do come back, and remember, we're not back yet, so park runs aren't happening now. Um, when we do come back, there will be some discrepancies. And those discrepancies will be that will be the result of all of those different factors combined, um, and we won't always be the same. But and we and we haven't been for many many years. It's, you know, anybody out there who's a part of an event director and a race director of a of a of an organised likely pay to enter race will know that the differences between delivery for those are, 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 are vast. What's important to us in this context is what is the risk of transmission of COVID-19 and comparing that to what is the public health benefits. And then remembering also that that understanding of the risk is changing almost every single day in, in multiple ways, be it levels of immunity, who's getting infected, what's happening to them, the, the, the strength of the virus and whether that's changing or not, and the, the seasonality of the virus. We're trying to fill in holes where there are holes, where there was a hole around outdoor versus indoor. We, we, supported we we hope university of christchurch and uh, canterbury and christchurch to fill that hole we're now looking um at actually the hole around what's the absolute risk what's the chance of infecting i mean from what i've seen the chance of infecting and this is this is me referencing things i've read so don't take this as, as in any way scientific fact but from what i've seen that if you live with somebody the chance of you infecting them is maybe five or ten percent so the chances of you, of you passing on the virus in a in a fleeting contact in an outdoor event like a park run must be significantly, you would expect, and this is what we're going to start looking at, significantly less than the 5 or 10% is if you lived with somebody where you might be sharing a, a, a dinner table every single day and, and so on. Um, and actually, when you start multiplying the, the, 
the chance of somebody being there with an infection by the chance of them infecting somebody if they are there, then that's really, in our opinion, really developing that knowledge to make evidence-based decisions. Now, I'm not saying England Athletics aren't making evidence-based decisions. The evidence is changing all the time. We're collaborating with them. And as our understanding develops, their understanding develops. And I think over time, you will see theirs and our guidance getting closer together rather than, rather than further apart. And we are talking probably every week. Okay, thank you for that, Tom. And thank you to everybody who's still with us because I recognise this is a long time. There's a lot of information that's being expressed. There's a lot of questions being asked. It's a lot of time to devote to people. And it's well worth then letting people know it's um, uh, you guys, your, your comms guys are going to collate all this, are going to put it into a written summary, going to make it available on the blog. So if you're not able to watch everything, um, but if you're worried about things that may have been addressed and you still have got additional concerns, you should be able to find it in the summary that the uh, comms guys will be putting into a blog to read at your leisure. Uh, so about next, I think it'll be done for next week. Obviously, there's a weekend coming up, but, um, but lots of people asking that question, apparently. Sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. we felt and we feel that the only way to, 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 to communicate why sweepingly address everything yeah. find our decisions is to go into the detail and the detail takes yeah. an awful long time and and i know you know a, a, a lot of people thinking oh it's two hours and we might go longer who knows but um it, it's the only way to communicate the information is to communicate all of, all of it and i totally respect that some people might not want to spend two hours listening yeah. to it that's fine but from, from our point of view i think we feel it's important that we one get as much information out there as we can, and I think that you know this this is this is the fifteenth or twentieth kind of long form piece of communication we've done. And get as much information out as well as we can, regardless of the time and effort that takes, and then allow as much time as possible for people to answer questions, maybe go away and reflect on an answer, and, and again and again, regardless of how long that takes. You know, we are we we're humbled to be in the middle of a community of seven million people across twenty two countries. And the only way to communicate it properly, in our opinion, is to communicate it in, in full. Yeah. And it's fair to say that a couple of hours like this is pretty much an abridged version of months of work <laughs> that's gone on beforehand. And that's the thing, trying to summarise that. Of course, you can't then go and show what you've been doing for the past, however, what's it, six months now since this whole lockdown thing to get to this particular stage. So I recognise that even, yeah, you've got there's a lot to try and compress, there's a lot to explain, and there's a lot of things to make clear to people. So, yeah, I think a lot of people really respect that, and I do too. All right, next question. I think we've still got a few more to come. Nick Wilson, if 100% return cannot be achieved, what is the minimum percentage coverage for the restart for the restart to go ahead? And will that be determined nationally or regionally? Um, great question. So we... All the way through this challenge, we've avoided putting kind of specific numbers on this is the trigger for, for, for that. I think it's a really dangerous game to say if this happens or if we get this number below this and so on. I, I think thinking it through, it, we, we know that we would, um, it's exceptionally unlikely that we would be able to get 100% compliance or 100% of landowners saying, yes, that's fine or, or whatever it might be. Um, as a rough sort of rule of thumb, we've been working off around about 5% is probably the highest number of, of events we could reopen without. That really isn't a hard and fast number. And it would depend around the challenges of those and which those events were and were they really, really, really busy events right next to a really quiet event. So they close and then that really quiet event gets really busy. So there's some nuances there and there's some complexity. Um but we're feeling like probably about 95%, much below that, we'd probably be, maybe 90% would be struggling for the part, for part one to work, as it were, beyond then. And I, and I think the from the various insights we've done, our intent to return question, the very simple intent to return question of, of if government guidance changed to allow part one to return, how likely would you be to, to, to come in four weeks? We feel that has been quite representative of the feeling across not just part runners, but across landowners, across event teams, across, across various stakeholders. And certainly where we've made um, more hands-on phone call type stuff. So we, we called a week or two ago, we called a selection of teams um, to see how they were feeling and to find out what the challenges they faced were. Um, 
and around about eight percent of those, and it was a, it was a relatively small number of teams, but around about eight percent of those felt, were were really really uncomfortable coming back. And our intent to return survey, which was going to the twenty thousand people a week, was was saying about eight percent. Now it's a small sample, and we're not going to you know make world changing decisions based on it. But I think probably that's about right. And when we made the decision to announce an intent of reopening towards the end of October, we felt the numbers were were pointing towards. Um, the I'm really unlikely to come back figure being being below five percent. To give you some comparison, in New Zealand when we reopened, it was two percent. Bearing in mind at that time when we reopened the first time, um, they hadn't really had much of the virus, and all social distancing restrictions had been removed. And f- for that, we had I can't remember the maybe's, but we had um, about two percent saying uh, I'm unlikely to come back, and about ninety something percent saying that they'd come back. Okay. Cool. Right then, Nick, probably one for you now. Uh, that A question that's probably repeatedly asked a lot, and then I think it comes down to the ethos of Parkrun, would be about the question that's often asked is limiting the numbers. Why not limit the numbers? And that, of course, I, I think it's very apparent as to maybe why not. Yeah, I mean, Tom is much better than me, actually, to answer this one. Like, I, I think, I don't know how we could do that. Please, Tom. That's what you're over. <laughs> so, because I've gone into Nick's doing this question mode, I'd, I'd, I was looking at some of the other comments coming in. Is this the is this question, Danny, about um, limiting numbers? Yeah, the limited numbers. Why not limit numbers? Why not limit numbers? It's often asked. Tom, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is something we've looked at again for many years. It's come up um, uh, time and time again um, since the very beginning of Part Run, and it's something we've been really concerned about in his, historically. Um, it. It's simply not possible to limit numbers in a way that protects the ethos of part run and doesn't turn it into a race where you have to enter in advance and get a race number or, or you know, whether you have a literal number or not. Um, it, 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 the, the, one of the key factors that make part run work across all sectors of society, I, I believe, is that you can make a decision at the last minute and just turn up or not. And actually, if you've got friends staying or family members staying or whatever, you can, oh, why don't you come along and get involved? Or if you're wandering through the park, you can just get involved. Or you can wake up um, in another town one day and you're away for the weekend. And you, oh, I wonder if there's a park run nearby and you can just turn up. Now, on one hand, people might say, well, can't you just make changes for a short period of time to get park run back and then and then take them away? But actually, change like that would be incredibly difficult and complex to, to do. So you know, would be completely rewriting our systems, which which may in itself not be possible. And then actually, if you find you're in six months or a year where you set a precedent that's hard to undo, at what point do you undo that? Suddenly, the the the, the essence of part run has been removed. So one, I don't think it's possible. And two, I think even if it was possible, I, I, I don't, I think it would break part run. And, and, and I think, you know, we had some very deep conversations early on in this, in, in lockdown so you know kind of late March early April around you know how far would we go in in changing part run in order to bring it back and like I say there are some red lines where actually as a as a leadership team we would rather it took years for part run to come back than break some of those red lines and we're not you know I'm not saying we're going to be stubborn and not change everything and make everybody suffer just because it's not how we want it to be but there are in some important red lines um that we need to respect and it and and having looked actually spent probably more than 10 years looking at limiting numbers um it, it just simply some, isn't something that's possible to do can i express it in a way i think that the minute you limit something you exclude people and park run pride itself on inclusivity and that's a thing it doesn't quite it clashes there's just a, an ethic there's an ethos clash there anyway um right next question i think we'll ask uh, about three more questions uh, Glyn Jagger, have you addressed, and this question comes up a lot and a lot and a lot, and it's very valid as well. Have you addressed how to wash tokens yet? We've been going a while, and most of ours have stickers on or paper and sellotape. For the sake of the environment, it would be bad to have to order a whole new set. So, of course, they're worried about the element of transmission with the virus being on the tokens themselves. That's one thing, of yeah. course, there may be a lot of transmission from as a vector there. Yes. So we, we've looked at this a lot, and we continue to look at it, and I don't think we've reached a finalised p- position. When we... Um, we're going through the process of submitting the framework and working through the framework with Sport England and DCMS and so on. 
we initially and think things things and understanding is changing so quickly that actually things like this can change so an opinion on whatever it might be masks or washing tokens or social distancing or, or transmission can be you know one thing one day and a week later it's different but at the time so going back to we when did we publish the framework early august so going back to late july early august um we were were our preference at the time was that um hardware like that so tokens so lanyards bibs could be quarantined rather than washed so it's relatively easy to wash bibs also some teams the biggest events have 50 or 60 volunteers not that easy necessary to wash and dry 50 or 60 vests um but our feeling in the early days was that um was that actually quarantine would be that would be appropriate we had at that time some pushback from um from public health saying actually the guidance really needs to be to to wash those so at the time of publishing the framework we said wash them they've been washing them in new zealand um so when they went back in new zealand i know they've been closed more recently we've actually had a set of tokens in our um australian office in the cold coast office and they've been washing them every day and seeing what happens to them and they've, they've kind of been okay at the same time the main reason for publishing the framework as early as we possibly could was to get as many eyes on it as we could possibly could around the world and for people to feed back. And one of the most powerful bits of feedback we've had across the whole framework is particularly for the older and larger teams where they've replaced a lot of tokens, they've got stickers on them, they've got printed stuff out in paper and sellotaped it on. Washing the tokens every week is going to be a real problem. It's going to destroy the, the more vulnerable tokens, the 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 older tokens and so on. And then there's going to be a real logistical challenge of replacing those tokens and obviously a cost of replacing those. So at the moment, we are actively looking at that specific piece of guidance around can we quarantine some of those pieces of hardware rather than wash them. We're hopeful that we can move it to the point where we're able to quarantine them. So effectively, people would drop the tokens into, into a bucket or buckets at the end. They would be taken home as is without having to get hold of them um and then on the thursday or friday they could be sorted and i know for some events that's a really big job sorting a thousand tokens for example again i think you know the the larger events by definition have more participants registered our com communications would be incredibly strong around please help out help out your event teams where you possibly can uh, i don't think event teams would have problems with with people coming forwards and saying, there's no problem, I'll take them home and I'll sort them on a Thursday and I'll bring them back on the, on the Saturday. Or if if social distancing and guidelines allow in a local area, I'll drop them around the Run Direct's house on a Friday night or something. So, so but that, that, that guidance is still um, changing. We're trying, to, we're trying to get it clarified a little bit better. Okay, thank you. May I just say that uh, Kipchoge and Pakeli could have run a marathon in the time that we've been talking about. So we're now, we've now gone beyond the world record for the marathon in terms of running uh, context. Right, next question. Uh, Beth Connor, and I, I think it is Beth Connor, uh, many event teams would have appreciated this forum before this public forum, given that we have to do all the work for the restart and have many of our own questions. So we're not skirting any difficult questions. Who wants to sort of address that point? I'll happily do, do it. Thank you, Beth. Okay. Um, so it, you know, it's it's a really um, valid point, and that you know there are many ways to to do things. I think our position was um, one: the most powerful thing we can do is call all the event teams. So we rang we rang them all up. We offered them we offered them all a call, and we rang them up, and we rang, we rang over a thousand. And you know, some of those calls went into one or two hours long for an in, for an individual call, and some were much shorter. I, I, I know, and lots of event teams I know didn't take up those calls. They maybe didn't necessarily see the value in them at the time, or they were they were you know otherwise you know engaged. Lots of people were going through lots of challenges during that time. But so, you know, the first thing we did pretty much was to contact all of our event teams around the world and say we'd, we'd love to have a conversation if we could schedule a call. Um, since that point, we've been speak. We speak to multiple event teams every single day, and and in the UK specifically, Helen Hood and Joe Sinton Hewitt are both. That's pretty much all they do every day is, is communicate with event teams and, and understand their challenges and, and and speak to them. We talked specifically before we did this about do we have um, an event team Q and A like this? So could, could we have an event team Q and A? It's difficult to do it in a private forum. So there are, there are ways we could have done it, 
But then how do you define an event team? Is it just the event director or is it the core team? And what's a core team and how do we how do we do that? And we felt in making that decision as to whether or not we do, do we do an event team Q&A? Do we do an ambassador Q&A? Do we do a public Q&A? And actually, from what we've seen, and we've had thousands upon thousands of questions coming in in every format you could imagine, from private messages on our own personal devices to emails to the support site to social media across all the channels. And actually, what we've found is the questions are very similar across event teams and across ambassadors and across part runners. The the event the questions are, are, are quite similar. So we felt that the most appropriate way to to move forward to do the to do next would be to hold as open and as in depth and as detailed uh, an update and Q and A session as we possibly could. Which I'm sure there are event directors listening, ambassadors listening. It's going to be uploaded afterwards. We're going to look to do a written summary of it. We're going to populate the FAQs on our COVID framework from it. And so we felt that was the most appropriate way um, to get the information out properly and in as much detail as possible to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you. All right, getting there now. Uh, ben Adams, I think the only way forward is to have a closed event to ease workload on volunteers and allow events to run with sufficient number of volunteers. I guess it's kind of slightly harking back to the limit of numbers. So who would like to address that? Yeah, let, let me dive into that, again. Penny, okay. I think because there are, you know, I first got involved in Parkrun in 2007 and I went to Bushy Park and I did Bushy Park Run, Bushy Park Time Child, it was called then. And I had, as most people listening to this, watching this will, will have had, I had that experience of this is just amazing. It's totally game changing. It's like, you know, I was a fairly competitive triathlete and runner at the time. And it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. It was, it was just wonderful. And that for me has been imprinted in my mind as 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 park run, as it were, as, as what we're trying to protect those those, those early days. And certainly in, in I started working for Park Run in 2011. Um, I became country manager of Park Run UK in 2012. And I've always seen my role as understanding what park run really, really, really is deeply and doing everything I can to protect that and not allowing it to change into something that isn't park run and there are there are loads of other things that aren't park run and they're wonderful you know whatever it might be london marathon or an iron man or a local 10k or a local half marathon or or a pay to enter 5k and all those things they're all great but you know my role for the last nearly 10 years has been in my responsibility in my opinion has been protecting park run from evolving into something that it isn't and losing the essence of park run and and losing the the, the magic of park run and, and what it achieves and i think you touched on it early earlier danny i think one of the absolute fundamental founding principles of park run is you can just turn up and take part and now i know we have events on custodial estates around the world so they are you can't just turn up at, at keppel park run at weatherby yoi and take part so i i of course, I accept. Although the people in the in the in those custodial estates can essentially turn up to their local park run on on a Saturday morning, but but for me, that having a closed event where you said you have to book in advance and only a certain number of people can turn up, and you can't just make your mind up on the day, for me, that would be a step too far for breaking and would break park run. Now, it, it, it at the moment that decision is you know could park run come back like, come back like that six months sooner or one year sooner and i my opinion and it would be supportive it is supportive we've had these discussions in detail with the trustees of park run global the charity including paul Sinton here at the founder is that that level of change um would be unacceptable to reduce the time it took part one to come back by six months or a year or something so if we had to if it meant we had to wait a year longer we wouldn't um, or we could come back a year sooner, we wouldn't make that level of change. If we were sitting around a table saying, part one may never, ever, ever come back, unless, in this case, you have a, a closed event, I still don't think it's, an, it, it's a, a decision we might make, and, and somebody else might want to make that decision, I don't know, but we have to understand what is really important about part run, what is great about part run, what, is, what makes part run part run, 
and and really avoid changing into something it isn't. I think there's a danger that that the current situation allows changes to be accepted in, in all walks of life that would normally be unacceptable. And they become this new normal, which is a term that personally I, I, I really struggle with. They become this new normal and then you can't go back. And then it's a problem. And where things are good, so, you know, the there's a good new normal in that we're, we're you know, the, the virtual volunteer is going to be compulsory. We've made these incredible changes. to it. In fact, we've not talked about it today, but we've made these incredible changes to it which will massively ease the results capturing and processing process, particularly for large teams. I mean, it's, it's an incredible change. And we I don't think we could have got that over the line outside of these exceptional circumstances. So I accept that there's been this exceptional circumstance, which has allowed us to get some good things over the line. We have to be incredibly mindful and sensitive to, to not so good things getting over the line because it's an exceptional circumstance and then not being able to change those back and it and it breaking the thing that we love uh, so much and so dearly. Thank you very much. Right. I think it's fair to say that we have been fairly comprehensive in a lot of uh, questions being answered, expression and, and regarding opinions, decisions and the work behind it. I think we should probably slightly look to wrap it up a little bit. I recognise the viewership as well, maybe decreasing a little bit. Um, and also, we've got a long day ahead. We'll come to that in a second. But um, Lisa Stevens makes a point. Uh, not all runners are depressed or lonely. People can still run and do other exercise, which has been proven to help. Yeah, well, I'll take that one, Danny. Thank you. Um, it, it's a brilliant point, Lisa. And actually, it's the reason, really, we're having this conversation. So I think that I think there's 7 million park runners, of which 4 million I've done a park run somewhere in the world and probably everybody, every one of those 4 million is looking at park run predominantly through their lens of their own experience. And so you're absolutely right. For some people, that is a privilege and luxury and ability that they have to be able to go out and get the benefit of physical activity um, on their own. However, and I think it's important to understand this, the reason that Park Run has been the phenomena that it is over the last 10 or 15 years is the, that there are tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of people for whom it is not that easy for a multitude of different reasons. You know, wh whether those are cultural barriers, whether they are the circumstances in which they live, whether they are the environment in which they live, th there, there are a multitude. And, and, and the reason that Park Run has succeeded in engaging those people and encouraging them into physical activity is it has offered to and been successful at looking at their life through their lens, empathizing and understanding and providing a space for them to participate in physical activity where they feel valued and an equal and they feel relevant where in other physical activity sectors, whether that be um, a, a gym or a conventional running event or doing it on their own that th they don't and so the reality is for that those people the tens of thousands the hundreds of thousands the millions of people the last six months have had that seized away from them and they're just not doing it because they didn't do it before and and th th those barriers and challenges that stopped them doing it for a year or for 10 years or for their whole life up until the point they found park run still exist they're still there, they're still problems. And so we feel an incredible responsibility to them. You know, they're not at home in their, you know, their luxury houses doing marathons around the back garden or press up challenges, or, you know, they're on the 10th floor of a, of a, a skyscraper with, with a family and two jobs and no opportunity to get out and park run offered like incredible opportunities to to meet people that support them, embrace them, um, and empowered them. And so it is for those people that we are pushing this phenomena back, not necessarily for the people exactly as you say, that can go to the park and run and get the physical and mental benefits of, of physical activity. Okay, fantastic. I think there is probably no better note to end on in that sense. And on an even lighter note as well, and because I, I feel like I've run a mental marathon regarding all that, and I've just been sitting here listening to what you've had to say. Uh, yeah, tonight, it's exciting. It is exciting because, of course, 
We were speaking about the return of England. That's not the only thing that's happening. Parkland Australia is coming back, the Northern Territories. that They have free events up there. They are starting. Um, I'll be broadcasting live with those guys at 10 p.m. tonight <laughs> as well. So I've got a long day ahead. Uh, but they start at 7 a.m. their time on the other side of the world. Cape Pembroke Lighthouse, which is in the Falkland Islands, that starts again today. So there's lots of little shafts of light that are appearing now with respect to Parkrun coming back and giving us all hope that we're going to get there eventually because it has to come back. I'm sure we all feel that it has to come back at some time. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for asking me on. I'm sure we'll be doing this again. And uh, I expect, and from looking at the majority of the comments, many people hugely appreciate the time and the explanations that have gone in. And yeah, I better go and get myself a cup of tea and have a rest. <laughs> but um, thank you very much. Thank you to for you guys for asking me to do this. And, uh, and again, I'm sure this is uh, many weeks ahead of asking, uh, answering questions, I should say. So shall we end thanks. it there? Yeah, thanks yeah, good. for tuning in and uh, putting up with us for two hours, especially putting up with Tom. Um, <laughs> and um, thanks to you, Danny, for, um, for offering to do this. We're really grateful. Thank you. Yeah, this is a resource now. This is a point of reference. This is a resource. Hopefully there is a point of reference for people to come back to and have uh, questions answered, which is now going to be permanently out there. Once we end this broadcast, it will be uh, obviously able to watch back on the Parkrun channel as well as the Facebook page too. Right then, I'm going to hit end, bronc hit end broadcast and uh, we can set a tar for now. But thank you for joining us, everybody. Take care. Speak soon. Thanks very much. Goodbye.